Good morning. You're still muted. Yes, good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Well, let's see. How am I? I'm actually really very good. I went last night and uh, got a massage. Uh, oh, that's to, good. Yeah, to get uh, rid of my uh, leg and ankle problem that I was having after carrying furniture and boxes up and down stairs all weekend long. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like the left leg went, you know, it's okay you do a little of it. This Not a lot. Time, but, yeah, you know, like three or four days straight in a row. Yeah, we don't want yeah. yeah, no. Um, I don't want to forget, um, did you hear back from life? I have not. Okay. Um, you'll get an email. It'll be forwarded to you from Magley. Um, what they said was they are excited. And the only thing is that can a bus take the students to life? We know that there'll be several people who won't who live in the area that will need parking. Parking is a concern mm -hmm. because classes will be in full swing. So that's, that's why they say, can a bus drop people off and pick them up? Yeah. yeah. Well, the only issue with that is that everybody, everybody's coming individually, um, you know, because we're not meeting at a center and then. Right. So that, that, I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't address it. I didn't want her to address it. So she'll forward it to you and, and you can address it from that point. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I don't think we're looking at 20 people or anything. Like no, that. we're not. We're probably looking about, you know, maybe eight to 10 at the most. Right. Would be my guess. You know? Yeah. So, and, and when I thought about it, I said to her, well, we have a student that lives in Marietta. He's not going to Sandy Springs and get on a bus. Yeah. And then, we have another student that lives southwest, which is below Estelle to me, as far as you know, my brain is working. Yeah. So she's she has to come from a different location too, so she can't get on a bus. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Right. <laughs> yep. Everybody's revolting. No, no, we're not on the bus. <laughs> so. Good morning. So I really think that, um, you know, we just have to work that part out. And after that, we're good. Okay. Which, which is people are coming from all aspects of the Atlanta metro area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, when I, when I get that email, yeah, her, I will, you know, reply all. Yeah. And and basically try to explain the situation. And yeah, she was like, I, I put Charles on the email, I'm not understanding why they just responded to me. I don't get that. She was just, I was like, just stay calm, it'll be all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it's modern technology. Yeah, and you know, sometimes they're so busy or they just, okay, let me just answer this and not think about, wait, 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 I'm supposed to respond uh, to the instructor, not to everybody else. Yeah, and it also may be that they were not ready at that point in time, mm -hmm. you know, to come down to a final decision and they wanted to get some feedback maybe from her. Or right. That, so they kept it internally. Yeah. You know, that's very possible, so. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> That's, that's kind of the way, you know, uh, corporate and, you know. Yeah, institutions run, run, right? Well, and it should be, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, until they sort of internally sort it out themselves and they're all kind of on the same page, you know, you don't really want to send the response out because right. if only half the staff is really kind of on board with it, then, you know, you're, you're going to end up, <laughs> you know, right. getting getting some resistance somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So No, I, I, the way it read, it was like no resistance, just, yeah, well, that's the resistance is the parking. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, we'll, we could be worked out. I don't think it should be too, too crazy. Yeah. yeah, and I think if, uh, yeah, I, I think if they understand, you know, it's it's probably not this huge number of people flocking on. Right. It's going to be a, a fairly small group. Right. Uh, 
you know, and nobody's driving like a, a Ford F-150 Dually or anything like that. You know, it's oh, speaking of that, you know, when they're in the parking lot, I'm like, they take up three spaces. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's coming in there with any of those. So. Right. Right. But for the most part, I think we all drive fairly mid-sized to small. Yes. Cars, so. Well, I guess that was from the gas line and the gas lines. Is it the 70s that we'd have to get gas on the your license plate number or something like that? Maybe that oh. was in Jersey. I don't know. Well, yeah, I think in the state of California, um, they came down to it's it's like, yeah, certain days of the week, certain ranges of numbers could go. And, right. that, and that stopped everybody from flooding to the gas station. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that was a horrible time. I remember that because yeah. there were so many people that just literally ran out of gas because it wasn't their day and they couldn't get, you know. To the station. Yeah, they didn't have enough gas to get to the station. <laughs> right, right. Uh, when was that? Uh, that when? was back in the 70s. Oh, I was here when Jimmy Carter was president. Yeah. But that, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's when, well, when that first hit, there were literally like gas lines that were like two and yeah. three miles. They kidnapped the American embassy in Iran. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. But good yeah. morning, Armando. Good morning, good morning. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad I can see your face because most of the time, most of the time you're in the dark. Oh. Well, likewise, not that you're in the dark. And you have different hairdo today. Yes. Yeah. Yes. When well, it gets too hot, I have to get it braided down or something because it's just too hot. Yeah, I can see Ms. Eloy's face too. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hello. You know, Ar Armando's trick is is not not that he sits in a dark room or anything, but the fact that he just he he adjusts the screen so all you see is from his like above his eyebrows. Up. But now I can show my favor. I got a haircut yesterday, so I look a little bit. Not that better, but a little bit. No, you look great. Good. Yes. Okay. Speaking of which, maybe I should turn this line on. It's kind of a, you know, it's not really a dark overcast day, but it's, you know, it's, it's not a bright sunny day. Oh, okay. Anyway. Yeah. Mm. You know, um, every day that we wake up is a good day, no matter what. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, that was not a complaint. It was just the, no, that was for Armando. Was it? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know whether you can see it or not. Yeah, back behind me there. I actually started a painting um, yesterday evening um, while I was out here at Winder, and I was coming back uh, from my getting my leg worked on. Um, it was such a beautiful sky, and I had stopped at a place called the French Quarter here in Winder. And I was just kind of sitting out on, on the patio and, and watching the sun. And in particular, I was watching this tree that was uh, back behind one of the buildings, but it was like sticking up. And I was just noticing, you know, because it was backlit, the overall value of it. But even though with the value being fairly dark, you know, you could begin to kind of differentiate slight variations in value and intensity that really kind of helped make that tree you know feel like it has this nice round volume to it and uh, so I decided I'm gonna start a new painting I'm gonna you know try to get some of that you know incorporated into this painting see if I can get a better understanding of uh, what I was seeing there so so uh, you know so I got a chance to actually push some paint around here at my brother's house and uh, I haven't I haven't ruined his office yet I haven't covered it in paint so I think <laughs> you know now if I can just get out of here on Thursday and not have the it. dog part you walking the dog uh, no 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 the dog doesn't walk what am I the dog, no she he he teeters his name is Angus uh, he teeters, you know, from his bed to the kitchen to get his medicine and his snacks, and he teeters. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, he's he's like, you know, Methuselah. <laughs> you know, literally. But he's, you know, well, he and I have had issues his whole life. Um, but he's he's finally mellowed out to the point where it's like I can watch him and he'll, you know, he just, you know, he's not he's not real aggressive or anything, you know, with me anymore. Uh, therefore, why it's like every time I came to the house, he was like barking at me and trying to nip at my heels. So it's been an ongoing thing with him for many years. But uh, yeah, no, he's he's mellowed right out. So in my viewpoint, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, in his viewpoint, not so much. He's not quite as energetic as he was when he was young. So, but. Uh, Anyway, we're here. We're taking care of it. So, um, hey, Jean, how you doing? Good. So far, I might have to leave a little early to go to PT. <laughs> this is an ongoing process. Yep, it is. Yeah, I, I went and got a little PT last night myself. I had uh, my leg worked on uh, by a massage therapist. And I have to honestly tell you, it's been a good number of years since I've had a massage. And uh, this is a, like a very kind of compact, small Korean woman. Uh, she murdered me. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I mean, that forearm and those elbows, man, I mean, she just dug into me. It was, I don't know, you know, the pain in the ankle was bad. The massage was worse during parts of it. And uh, I finally had to just like stop her and go, hey, look. You really got to like like <laughs> the pressure was too much yeah it was just like yeah she was like dog chasing his tail it's always something <laughs> yeah but anyway i feel much better today my my ankle actually bends i'm flexing and i hadn't done that in like three or four days so yeah, great anyway um i've got one other thing to mention that doesn't have to do with class uh, I, has anybody been following the news Congress, yeah, Congress just did something that, you know, which occasionally they actually do something good, okay? Um, and they they just passed, it's called the PACT Act, and it's for veteran health care. And um, what? For veterans health care. It's oh. about time. Oh, veterans. Yes. Yes. You're breaking up. That's the only reason I... Okay, well, at any rate, um, earlier during the week, um, you know, they had an initial vote on it and it passed, and then it went into some reconciliation and they messed with it. And then it went back out to the Senate, and the Senate killed it, of which the veterans who were all standing outside of, you know, the uh, the Congress building, um, or the Senate building, uh, got very upset, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Oh, I wonder why. Well, um, they don't use any brains. Kind yeah, of. well, they've been trying to get this passed since the time of Barack Obama, okay? It's been years that they- well, I'm surprised been... it wasn't with Eisenhower. Right. I mean, if they're so slow. Yeah, but it's it's been years that they've been working on this, and you know, it, it several times it's gotten close to passage, and then for whatever reason they they tank it. Um, so at any rate, yes, they they tanked it earlier this week, uh, or maybe it was towards the end of last week, and really got some folks upset. Um, and finally, um, both parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, actually got together and worked out some things on it and finally passed the thing. So now it's passed. Okay. Bless the Lord. Yeah, it's actually law now. And, um, and now it will be up to the VA um, to administer it. But the fact is that now a lot of veterans and their families who had been denied benefits before, because it was really... You know, I understand that the VA has like very limited resources, but you know, but you had to go through so many hoops 
to get them to actually give you the care that you needed as a veteran. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, they've just passed this. So that, that will really have a profound, well, we're all hoping. <laughs> yeah, let's put it that way. We're all hoping yeah. that it will have a profound effect and that the, uh, the VA will begin treating more veterans without all the red tape and, and stuff involved. Um, because it's, it's just literally, I mean, you know, since the time I've gotten out of the military service, you know, my experience with it has been, you know, I've, I've got some fairly serious things going on. And, yeah. you know, to get the VA to do anything about it is next to impossible, you know. And it's only gotten harder over the years. Um, and so, so we'll see. We'll see what happens now, you know. But I was glad to hear that, that they finally got together and worked it out and actually passed the thing. Because uh, it's been a long, long time coming. So. so if you know any veterans or anything like that, let them know. Okay. All right. So today, today we're going to talk about painting and, uh, and art really? in general. Okay. And I got a couple of things, um, you know, that I want to share with you. And uh, I think you'll find them inspirational and enlightening, okay? Um, and one of the very first things is about a young woman who, she's talking about her journey of becoming a professional artist, okay? And uh, yeah, I think it's well worth listening to. Some of you might, uh, might pick up some ideas or, uh, you know, get, uh, And, uh, um, you know, might, might get some ideas about, you know, how to do this, okay? So we're going to start right here. It's about 20 minutes long, okay? Get the ads, please. Hi, friends. Welcome back to my channel. I thought I would spend some time today doing... Uh, it's going to do the typical YouTube, all right, so we'll back it up. Let's see if we can get it to run all the way. Through. Hi, friends. Welcome back to my channel. I thought I'm would... today doing an updated Q&A for you all, so I asked for questions on my Instagram story and in the YouTube community post. So I'll be answering some of those questions for you today. I'll try to get to as many as I can. You all asked a ton of great questions that I wish I could answer all of them, but this video would be hours long. I'm also going to include some footage of my trip to DC and a little watercolor Didn't do that. Today's Q and A. Yeah. So a question that I got a lot. That Maybe we can. Great answer. questions that I wish I could answer all of them. Yeah. Going to include some footage of <clears throat> my trip to DC and a little watercolor painting I did of the Smithsonian Institute while I was there. So I thought it would be a good idea to combine that with today's Q and A. So a question that I got a lot that I talked a little bit about in my last Q&A, did I go to art school or am I self-taught? I did take some art classes in college, but I consider myself to be largely self-taught. Right before I graduated high school, I thought I really wanted to go to art school, but it didn't work out for me then, and I decided to go to school for architecture because it was still a creative field. Turns out I didn't like that as much as I thought I would, so I did actually enroll in a lot of my community college's art classes at that point, trying to make the switch into a fine arts major. But they didn't really prepare me to submit a portfolio at the big arts college that I wanted to go to. So I didn't get into that arts college and was pretty discouraged for a while thinking, well, maybe art is not the path for me. So I switched majors again to a social media marketing degree and I graduated with that degree. Everything that I've learned in the past six months of sharing my art journey with you all has really shown me how much you can learn about art on your own if you dedicate time to practice. And there are tons of resources online that really can teach you a lot about practicing your skills and creating habits that help you grow and achieve your goals as an artist. 
Someone asked, I'm a mid-level artist who uses acrylics and decided to use oil paint in a still life, but I had a hard time finding tutorials for beginners. It would be nice if you mentioned how or where you learned oil painting when you started painting. Thank you. I will link some creators down below who I follow and watch their YouTube tutorials. They do a lot more of like painting tutorials, teaching you how to paint and things like that. And a few other questions have asked me to do kind of more tutorial videos like that. And I just, I want to defer to them because they've been doing it a lot longer than I have. They have a great way of teaching and they already have videos out for you to watch for free on YouTube. So I'll link some of theirs down below. Ones that come to mind are Chelsea Lang, uh, Paint Coach, uh, Ian Roberts. People like them are great, great painters and have so many good tutorials on YouTube already. Another question I got was advice on how to become a full-time artist, how to start making money from your art, from your career, and how I'm doing that. And my simple answer is that you have to have a lot of different streams of income as an artist. I think... Wayfair has everything I need to make my home total. I think there's this big idea that in order to be a full Okay. Back it up. There you go. Or Chelsea Lang, uh, Paint Coach, uh, Ian Roberts. People like them are great painters and have so many good tutorials on YouTube already. Another question I got was advice on how to become a full-time artist, how to start making money from your art, from your career, and how I'm doing that. And my simple answer is that you have to have a lot of different streams of income as an artist. I think there's this big idea that in order to be a full-time artist, you have to be living off solely sales from paintings, from prints, from things like that. And I don't think that's realistic. Or sustainable and honestly it's kind of scary um, because you know those things change with time and for me it's a lot better to diversify my income through you know ads on YouTube sponsorships with companies that I've been able to do thanks to you all watching my channel I have made money from selling art and commissions and things like that but it's not my sole source of income right now and I think that's okay. I still consider myself a full-time artist. Kelsey Rodriguez is another art YouTuber, and she has great videos about how to actually make money as an artist, selling online, you know, all the different social media aspects of it. So I recommend you watch her video on it. She does a great job of laying it all out for you in a really easy to understand way. Someone asked, I would love to know how you become a full-time artist. For someone like me who has no idea, do you just quit your job and make art? How do you make money and get noticed? How do you get customers when you've never made art before and no one knows who you are? And I think social media, I mean, I have a degree in social media marketing. I don't have an art degree. Um, so I think it's really opened my eyes to the different avenues and paths that people can take to become a full-time artist these days. Becoming an artist, I think in general, even people who go the traditional route of like going to galleries and like things like that, is all about building a community, even a clientele that knows your art, wants to buy your art, loves what you do, and wants to support you through that way. And social media has made that a possibility for so many people who are just starting out with art, who are just sharing their art journey online. So of course that's going to be my advice to you is to utilize, you know, the good aspects of social media um, and just start sharing your art with people. Because I think that's something that a lot of people also connect to. For an artist, it is obviously about the art you're making, but it's also about you. It's about what you're bringing to the art that you're creating and how your story kind of ties into that, how your interests are seen through every piece of art that you work on, through every new 
subject matter that you're exploring. I don't think there's any shame with keeping a part-time job. You know, we have to be <laughs> responsible and logical and pay our bills and things like that. Getting a part-time job and working on your art career, if you're not able to do that, I know it's a very privileged position. I know a lot of full-time artists who still have full-time jobs and it's all about making those sacrifices in the present to work for a future that you really want. Another question that ties into becoming a full-time artist that I got was, how was I able to financially pursue art full-time? And this is a very logical question and something that I did think about a lot before I made this decision. There is a lot of pressure to choose a career that is very stable, obviously, financially, and to an extent that's very smart. Um, but for me, I also knew I needed to do a career that was going to make me stable mentally, if you get what I mean, doing something that I'm not going to hate for 40 plus years. And that's a very American way of thinking, I understand, a very privileged way of thinking. And I am privileged enough to have a partner that has a stable job that said, hey, I can support us for this amount of time while you try to get your art career up and running. And if it doesn't start making enough money soon enough, you know, I said I would get a part-time job on top of trying to work on my art full time. And for me, it was something that I wasn't going to give my all to unless I had the pressure to give it my all. So that's how I was able to make it work really cutting back on expenses, saving up money from my past social media job, and relying on my partner for our income while we don't have children or a lot of expenses or anything like that. So for me, like I said before, diversifying my income so I'm not relying on one area for money every month, it's really been the best option. And again, no shame at all in having a part-time job, having a full-time job while you're trying to make your full-time art career happen. How much money do you think you've spent from all of your art materials? Um, a lot. <laughs> I'm not sure I actually want to add that up. It might be a little scary. Um, art supplies are very expensive and the really good quality ones are even more expensive. So yes, a lot. I don't even think I could put a number on it. I've been buying art supplies since I was 15. <laughs> yep, they're expensive, but what can you do? Gotta have them. <laughs> I had a few questions about my personal life and things like that, so I'll answer some of them. Yes, I am married. I have been married for almost two years to my partner. Uh, we actually met in high school, uh, senior year of high school, and dated all throughout college and got married after college. So we have known each other for a very long time and have kind of been growing up together. You've probably seen him in some of my videos on here. His name is Brett. I got a few for just $67. Come on. Few questions about my ethnicity, which I am using mixed, um, but it's something that I'm very proud of, so I will share it with you all. I am half Chinese, and my dad is half Italian. My mom grew up in the Philippines, actually. She grew up in Manila, so she's Chinese, but her family um, grew up in the Philippines, so they speak Tagalog and all of that. Um, so I kind of have that cultural influence and the Chinese cultural influence. My favorite types of food are pasta or Chinese food, and I really do think they're the best, but I may be a little biased. I also got a lot of questions about starting a YouTube channel, growing an audience, how to edit videos, what apps do I use to edit my videos, filming equipment. So I'm gonna answer all those questions in this one long rambling answer probably. My best advice for someone starting a YouTube channel is you have to be okay with putting yourself out there, sharing very, you know, personal connections with your art, and there is going to be criticism. I don't want this to sound depressing and sad and not doing it, but if you are kind of just starting on your art journey, make sure that starting a YouTube channel is not going to discourage you from continuing practicing your art. Because at the end of the day, 
that is what's most important. I know for myself, I don't think I was quite ready to receive that much, you know, opinions on my art and my life. I don't regret it, but it is something that I had to get used to. And I do still consider myself like learning on my art journey. Have a realistic view of where you are with your skills and your art and know that people are going to make comments about that. That's okay. Um, you're going to find so many more people who are encouraging, who are lovely, who leave the nicest comments I've ever read. Hold on to those people. That being said, I guess more practical advice for starting a YouTube channel is to do a lot of research into how to film, how to edit video, sound quality. I have taken courses with Adobe that have taught me how to edit better, how to film better, just the ins and outs of video editing and how to use their program. I use Adobe Premiere Pro to edit all my videos, by the way. Um, not sponsored, but I love them. <laughs> Another practical advice for filming videos is that you can start using your phone. My first two videos I filmed entirely on my iPhone, um, and they are the videos that have the most views. So, I mean, what does that tell you before I even upgraded to a camera? It's totally possible to just film off your phone. Another practical advice is to buy a tripod. I have used a tripod that I got off Amazon for like $20 until very recently, um, and it worked great. Some questions about the equipment I use now, it's always linked below in the descriptions of my videos, but I use a Canon EOS M50 to film my videos now, and I love it. It's a great little vlogging camera. I've watched tons of videos on YouTube about filming, editing, how to film more cinematically. There's just so much free information out there that if you just take some time before you start your channel to really research how to do things more professionally, I think it's really going to pay off in the end. Who are some of my painting inspirations? Who are some of my favorite artists? Obviously, Monet, Van Gogh, Bonnard, um, Renoir, lots of Impressionist painters, um, John Singer Sargent, and tons of contemporary painters that I'll put their names like on the screen here because I can't think of all of them off the top of my head, but I follow lots of them on Instagram. Those are my inspirations. The connection that I seem to find through all these people is that their brushwork is so interesting. They're painting more loosely. They're painting a little more impressionistically. For me, I just love seeing how someone has so much control over their brushwork to be able to use you know, limited strokes to present something so realistically, but simply. If you have any artists that you love, that you think I'll love, please send them to me. I love looking at art and finding new inspirations all the time. The best way to start selling your art, how to sell it online, how to not sell it online. And this is not something I can speak to greatly off of my own knowledge, but I have been doing research into this because I do want to start selling my art online, um, original things, prints, things like that. That's kind of my next big step in my art journey. I know there are art fairs. Maybe your community has a weekend farmer's market. You can set up a table there. You can sell to your friends and family that you know just to get started. But for me, I would say selling online is a great way to go. I think, I mean, this is going to be something I say all the time in my background with social media marketing. Like, use it to your advantage. Use TikTok, use Instagram Reels, use YouTube to create a community of people that love what you're creating and love your vision as an artist. And if you offer things to them, offer your pieces that they've seen you create in your videos, in your Instagram posts, I think they're going to connect with that and want to support you and own a piece of your art. There are so many artists that I follow online that I've bought pieces from. I want to start buying more pieces from artists that I've followed online for a long time. And it's just because you have that connection with them, you know, and you love what they're creating. How do you set boundaries with social media and YouTube as a content creator? I spent Today, I would like to show you 70 ingenious projects I've built around my house that you can easily replicate in your own property. In fact, what I will spend obviously a lot of my time on social media.
<sighs> YouTube and Zoom. Come on. Take it back a little bit. You offer things to them, offer your pieces that they've seen you videos and your Instagram posts. I think they're going to connect with that mm -hmm. and want to support you and own a piece of your art. There are so many artists that I follow online that I've bought pieces from. I want to start buying more pieces from artists that I've followed online for a long time. And it's just because you have that connection with them, you know, and you love what they're creating. Mm How -hmm. do you set boundaries with social media and YouTube as a content creator? I spend obviously a lot of my time on social media, creating things for social media. The thing I've done most importantly, I think, is to dedicate days of my work week to filming days, content creation days, and then days where I'm not doing any of that. And I think that kind of helps set a boundary so that I don't feel like I have to film every aspect of my life, every single thing I'm doing. And that way you can still keep a boundary from your personal, private life, and the things that you choose to share on social media. I had a lot of questions about people dealing with art block. How do I find inspiration? Whenever I'm feeling art block or lack of inspiration, I actually made a whole video about it if you want to watch that. But short answer is I just try to get out of my comfort zone and take off some pressure. Do something for fun, um, paint something you never would. How is your creativity after so many new subscribers? Does it cause you anxiety? It does cause a little anxiety because obviously I want to keep creating content for you and putting out videos. But something that I've done that's kind of helped that is just to take pressure off what I'm creating and just sharing my journey as it comes. So not being so strict about, oh, I need to create a large oil painting every video. I need to create 10 sketches every video. I'm kind of like, when I'm sharing my art journey with you all, I'm really just sharing how I'm learning what I'm doing that week in my practice, what I'm doing to improve my art skills at that time. I'm just trying to keep it really honest and open with you guys that not every week am I creating large oil paintings. Sometimes I'm just focusing on practicing anatomy. That's how I kind of keep that anxiety at a minimum. I'm not forcing myself to do things that I'm not ready to do creatively. I'm just sharing my literal journey. this artist's name? Uh, let's see what her name is. Ashley King. Ashley? Ashley. King. King. K-I-N-G. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, the reason I played that for you, because she brought up some really interesting points or questions, okay? And I know that you know, most of you are not at this point trying to make art a career, okay? But whether you're trying to make it a career or not, um, there are, you know, she had some points that kind of apply. Um, like for example, art supplies, right? Uh, art supplies are expensive, right? And it's like, if you're living on a limited income, you know, let's say you're trying to live. Tell me about it. Yeah. It's it's like, you know, how how and where do you go get art supplies? Right? And how do you keep a good stock of art supplies on hand so that you can keep creating? Um now one of the things I can tell you, you know, being in the position that I'm in right now, you know, with uh, Fulton County is that's why in our classes, for the most part, other than the plain air class, um, we pretty much so focus on providing all the materials, right? And, and have been in the past because there's, I think a very good understanding and a realization, you know, that uh, 
you know, seniors in particular, you know, a lot of you are living on limited incomes and you don't have a lot of disposable uh, funds. So at the Benson Center, we stock art supplies. Um, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, I've stockpiled literally years worth of acrylic paint, oil paint, brushes, uh, you know, pretty much so everything, you know, including paper. Um, about the only thing I haven't really stockpiled there is canvases because pretty much so I'll leave that up to any of you to provide the kind of surface that you want to work on. But, uh, but we do have a lot of paint there, right? And, um, you know, just to make you aware, you know, as we move from the summer class, you know, which is a plein air outdoor class, and we move into the autumn and the winter classes, uh, we are going to be doing more on-site, you know, in, in studio painting, um, you know, to take the place of the plein air because we, you know, how many of you want to be out, you know, in the middle of like November, December, January, in the middle of like freezing cold weather? You know, please raise your hand, you know, let me know. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not an Eskimo. Yeah, I, I didn't think a lot of you, you know, really wanted to do that. So, How about myself, depending the weather, yes, uh, lately I haven't participated in this outside painting because I hate the heat, even I'm from South America. Yeah. So in the fall, as long as the temperature don't go below 40, I can be outside. Yeah. Well, now, in, you know, just to let you know kind of what the plan is, because I'm getting a lot of uh, pressure, you know, from Sabrina and from downtown to have more on-site classes. And my answer to them has always been, you're getting Fridays. <laughs> but, um, you know, as we move into the fall and the winter, um, and particularly once we get into the winter, uh, let's say, mid-November through like February or, you know, toward the end of March, uh, all of those classes will move indoors uh -huh. and yeah. will shift from painting outside to doing, you know. Let, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. When you do outside classes, yeah, it will be too difficult to, when, when the weather is so bad, it will be too difficult to follow you on Zoom. No, um, okay, here's the thing, okay. <clears throat> we ran into a situation a couple of weeks ago, right? Where we had an outdoor class planned, but the weather was so bad, we just said like, mm, no, okay, we're, yeah, we don't need to be out there. Um, and so we're, we're gonna have to get, I, you know, not we, I, I am gonna have to get better at getting, you know, in contact with you guys and making a decision early. If it looks like it's gonna be bad weather, you know, we will just shift the class to Benson inside. Okay. In the fall, will your classes be at the Benson Center? Uh, well, that's what I'm saying. It probably early fall, no, but, you know, as we move into like November when it it's, well, I meant uh, when you stop planning for the out of doors, will you go into the Benson Center for classes? Okay. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Like, you know, over that like three, maybe three and a half month period, you know, we, we won't do outdoors because it will be generally too cold for most people. Right, and, right. You know, I know we have a few hardy individuals, but, you know, like Eloise, who really would love to get out at you know like 22 degree weather you know in the middle of a in the middle of an ice storm in paint but, you know, but she's she's an exception you know not the rules so i'm sorry not me i yes. I'm sorry i was on a phone call and i didn't hear that remark but not me okay. <laughs> all right at any rate uh so yeah probably here you know around the first part of november we'll start shifting 
and, and going indoors on a fairly regular basis. You know, well, not fairly. You know, pretty much so through that about three, three and a half month period. You know, until, right. until the weather becomes nice enough on a consistent basis that we can get back outdoors again, all right? And so, you know, that's, that's the general plan. Right. And it, and it, you know, it satisfies several things. You know, one, it gives people a chance uh, to go paint in a studio, you know, with some supervision, um, not, you know, and yet it keeps that plain air class alive. And it's, right. it's not like we're going to change the title of it or anything. It will just be that, you know, during that period of time, it'll be indoors. And the focus won't be landscapes, it will be doing still lives or, you know, just doing your own work, you know, anything that you want to work on. Um, the only limitations um, that I can think of right now is that for the most part, we're going to end up having to work either in watercolor or in acrylic. Um, because, you know, the, well, because going inside, there are going to be people who have a high degree of sensitivity to oil paint. To oils. I'm one of them. Yeah. yeah. Now, Charles? Yes. It's very convenient that they, you keep the Zoom, the class in Zoom, because what I noticed last Friday when we had a class inside, we were too many people crammed in that room. We were like a, uh, on each other. Mm -hmm. Well, and we had about 13 people on Friday there in that room. 12, well, okay. We had 11. <laughs> All right. 11, 11 people were in the room. Well, 12, including me. Okay. And then when, um, when Sabrina stuck her head in the door, then, yeah, we had 13. But she didn't count because she didn't stay. But uh, no, there were actually only 11 people attending the class on site. And there were seven people on Zoom. Okay. Now, as far as your question about maintaining Zoom, Zoom is not going to go away. Oh, good. You know, yeah. Uh, it it has become a standard mode of operation. You know, to present classes of all sorts. You know, health classes nutrition classes, art classes, and everything else. So that's going to remain with Fulton County, okay? And in fact, um, that kind of leads me to the next thing I was going to talk about um, that she brought up, which was, okay, how do you make a, you know, how do you make a living as an artist, right? And one of the ways that you can do that is that you can share your experiences and your knowledge base with other people via classes that you can teach online. Or even if you don't want to teach classes, and she does not, uh, you can still create an income stream on YouTube by just sharing, you know, your particular experiences. And there are many artists on, uh, you know, on YouTube. Uh, as well as other media platforms that actually make revenue, <clears throat> you know, and they, they do, they get a, you know, a monthly or a quarterly check, you know, from YouTube, you know, because of the amount of people that they have following them and, and the number of views that they have on their uh, media. So, so there is a way these days of actually making a living, you know, not only for visual artists, but, you know, I mean, you know, if you, if you check out, you know, different media streams, such as Instagram, um, you know, Facebook, uh, YouTube, things like that, you can actually make money off of a lot of those streams. Um, you know, if you get a big enough following and if you promote your, you know, what you're doing, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of those media companies will actually pay you um, because you're driving 
people to their site and you know then they can you know basically sell advertising you know to your viewers and so you get paid for that um in fact i can think of several cases you know uh channels that i follow on a regular basis on youtube um one is a young woman who talks about you know living as a digital nomad uh and making money doing that and she actually does very very well um uh, i think she's well making well over a hundred thousand dollars a year just off of her youtube channel and all she does is she'll go and live in these different countries and these different places um <clears throat> you know, for a period of time and talk about, you know, what she's doing you know? and, uh, you know, and share some, you know, things about the culture, uh, you know, things about, you know, the technical aspects of how she writes uh, videos and edits, you know, her pieces and things. She shares really a lot of information. Um, and sometimes even, uh, she gets into some of the political things going on in those particular countries at the time that she's living there. And it's, it's generally really interesting content. Um, you know, depending on what you like to listen to. Uh, but she also talks about, you know, finance and money and how to save money and how to invest money, um, you know, in the world today. And, you know, the stock market isn't the only place you can put money now. Uh, she's kind of into like cryptocurrency and into um, MFTs and, you know, things like that, um, you know, that she invests in. And we'll all see how all that turns out in the long run. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of skeptical, but, you know, but there are people out there doing stuff like that. So anyhow, um, you know, and I guess, you know, for me, I guess my avenue or my thought or the, the kind of journey that I'm on right now is I've decided to work for Fulton County for the next couple of years until I retire at 70. But even after I retire at 70, um, my plan is to supplement any, any kind of art that I can sell, you know, by commission, you know, portraiture, things like that, because that's kind of what I do. Um, but supplement that with teaching and maybe, you know, travel, you know, travel around the country, you know, offering workshops, uh, but also the thing to support the workshops and drive interest in those is to have an online presence, you know, and keep offering, you know, classes and things very much so like this, you know, in this kind of format. Uh, it's just offering it to a broader audience and not to just Fulton County participants, right? So, so there, are, you know, there's things that we can do, um, you know, to give ourselves, uh, as she was suggesting, you know, more than just one income stream. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice having Social Security as an anchor. It's nice having a little money in your 401k but uh you know who knows really in the future whether that's gonna be able to keep you afloat or not and so you know you've got to kind of take a, a broader look sometimes and uh and and plan so that uh you know you've got some choices to make <laughs> so, anyway um but you know one of the things like really for the last, really about 10 years that I've been doing is I've been investing in art supplies. You know, um, I take a certain percentage of the money that I get every month and I put it into buying art supplies and stockpiling things like oil paint and acrylic paint and canvases and art materials that I'm going to need so that when I retire, I don't have to run to the art store all the time. And I don't have to be spending my limited amount of income on those art supplies. So, you know, I've been, uh, I've been stocking up on things for almost 10 years now. 
and uh, you know that has its its bonuses you know in the sense that you know I bought a lot of art supplies that uh, you know art supplies are like everything else you know more than likely they're not going to get cheaper in the future and so by buying them you know like five years ago uh, I'm using paint that costs me much less than what it would cost me to buy today. So, and so any opportunity that I get, you know, from now to the time that I retire, you know, I'm literally putting probably 20, about 20% 20 of my monthly income into stockpiling art materials. You know, and, um, you know, it, that's just my strategy. And, you know, it makes it hard to pack all that stuff up and move to Alabama, <laughs> but, um, you know, but it's well worth it and it will save me money in the long run you know, by doing that. Um, and, you know, I mean, opportunities like, for example, when, you know, I have Anita come over the brush lady, you know, those are good opportunities to, you know, get, some pretty expensive stuff. Uh, generally, brushes are not cheap, and being able to get them at a discount is, uh, you know, is a is a big benefit. So try to take advantage of those when you can. Okay. Um, anybody got any any comments about that video or anything? You know, any of you want to add in? Quiet. <laughs> okay, I guess not. All right. Nope. All right. So moving on. All right. Let's go to uh, all right. I love this guy. Um, this is uh, 20, 20 ways or twenty seven ways your art can change your life, and. Uh, Grammarly makes communication at work. Okay. Skip ads. I've been making art for decades, and it is. Okay, you too. And Zoom. Doing its thing again. I've been making art. I didn't click on anything. Come on. I hate this. All right, you gonna go? I've been making art. Right. Better than his video. No matter when you start. It... Huh. All right. This is going to give us a lot of trouble, isn't it? Okay. I've been making art for decades, and it is in so many different ways. No matter when you start, it can change yours too. It can make you more resilient and calm and joyful. I want to tell you some of the benefits that I've discovered of living a creative life. We gain control. Stress is elevated when we feel a loss of control, but art making gives you that control back. You have a blank sheet of paper and you can make anything you want. Hey. I'm not stopping you. Come on. What is going on here? Meditation gives perspective. When you draw, your chattering mind slows down. Your focus narrows. And you lose all sense of time. You enter the flow zone, that, that, that magical realm of intense creative output. When you emerge, you feel refreshed. The world looks different, it looks better. When you do it, the stronger and 
long lasting that effect. Find positivity. There's a myth that artists are moody or they live in a dream world, but the truth is the opposite. Art making lets you focus on the now to live in this beautiful moment. Instead of using your imagination to worry about all the bad things that can happen one day, put it to work discovering all the things that are beautiful right in front of you. The universe has surrounded you with gifts. The, the languor of your cat on the windowsill, comfortable wrinkles of your favorite pair of shoes, the, the huddle of trash cans down a back alley, the, the signs of a well-lived life on your father's face. Start seeing like an artist and the world brighten and transform. Value the journey, not just the destination. Life in art has no end goal, just a series of wonderful adventures and discoveries. Picasso kept inventing art well into his 90s, and so could you. As you keep practicing and experimenting, mm. you'll discover what the Zen masters know. For enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. Artists connect. You can share what you're thinking, what you're feeling, simply by showing your art to a friend or posting it online. It's also a great way to discover what other people think and feel to explore the, the vast world of art making that's out there. As you connect with other artists, you'll, you'll have a growing sense of belonging, identity, and of shared goals. Make progress every day. Learning to make art is literally a lifelong progress process. You never stop discovering and making progress. By being consistent and patient, surprise yourself with what you can make. The road may not always be smooth, there'll be setbacks, but the key is to commit steadily to taking one step at a time. Embrace the process of self-improvement, not being self-critical. Focus on what you can learn, not on what have so far failed to master. The joy of mastery. You work on your art, you develop a growing sense of competence, learn new tools, new techniques, and you'll make things that blow you away. You'll realize the power that resides within you. You can do this. You can do so much. Find comfort in ambiguity. There's no right or wrong in making art. There's no step-by-step -step way to paint. As you learn these lessons, you will feel freer and less confined. It's all, it's all about discovery. Set your assumptions aside. Keep your eyes open, your mind fresh. Be comfortable with not knowing. Just play, it's okay. It's okay to waste time. Our days are so scheduled, so packed with distractions, but we need to give our tired brains time to restore themselves. Stop, take 10 minutes and draw something simple every day. Don't feel guilty, embrace the stillness. That's where creative ideas flourish and your mind can revive. Rediscover analog, we spend our days in virtual worlds, nose buried in screens. Give yourself the gift of a soft pencil on paper, the gentle blossoming puddle of watercolor, the tactile spring of a scratchy pen nib. Drop your mouse for half an hour and feel unique. Accept failure. Creativity is all about experimenting and, and most proper experiments fail at first, you just just try something else. Lose the fear of being wrong. Embrace acceptable risk. That's how real progress is made, through blundering into the unknown. Think less. The average person has 50,000 thoughts a day. For most people, a lot of those thoughts are, are negative or limiting. Stop living between your ears. Art lets you go. Christian to get out there to deal with life as it truly is, not just what those 50,000 ghost bubbles imagine it might be. Make. 
productivity focuses the mind, gives you a sense of accomplishment, and, and moves you forward. Establish creative habits, block out time, make, make things, good or bad, it doesn't matter, every day. Don't take, think. Shopping, soothe your soul. Cook, sing, draw, grow, knit, build, and share with the world. Perfectionism is soul crushing. Creativity isn't about niggling and tweaking. It's about old ideas that solve problems. Make do with what you have and can do today. Just keep churning the work out. Make stuff, not endless revisions. We are born artists. Humans are naturally creative, and art is what makes us human. Our amazing ability to imagine and then build what we dream up. This includes you, no matter what your job is or what your background is. Embracing hate creativity. <clears throat> Speak your truth. We all have something to say, to share with you. You don't know what yours is? Start exploring, experimenting, trying things on. Delve deep inside and unearth your story and your wisdom. Use your voice and see what comes out. Express yourself. Show what makes you different. There's nothing different about you? Impossible. We are all the product circumstances and experiences. If you can't see it, you need to stop and look inside. Discover what makes you special. It's in there. You can do this as well as anyone. We've all started with crayons and paper. Try stuff. We screw up. Keep going. It's life. There's no one right way. There's just more way. We won't make art like Rembrandt or Shakespeare. And guess what? They didn't make art like you. Only you can make you art. If you let yourself start making it. Let go. Don't attribute too much value to every thought and idea you have. Be willing to just toss it aside and come up with something different and better. Trust your ability to dream up stuff. You can do it once you try. Don't wait to be ready. Time is never right. Time is always right. Don't wait for your next vacation, for the kids to grow up, to find the right pen. Waiting is too risky. Just mm. take the first step today. And then Creativity prepares us for change. Change is inevitable. It lets us see what truly is to observe, to respond. Artists aren't dreamers, they're visionaries. They're tough. They're fearless, they're brave. They see what really is. Creativity gives us a sense of control because we've grown the muscles to respond. Our brains are nimble and prepared. We see clearly, we can quickly come up with solutions to life's change challenges. Artists are the ones who remember. Not bureaucrats, naysayers, we're the problem solvers. Find your thing. Having a purpose in life gives you motivation and energy and fulfillment and courage. Find your true calling. It's not about money or security. It's about being your true self. Now, more than ever, that's not luxury. It's a bedrock essential. Talent is a myth or it's irrelevant. People who accomplish great things aren't born lucky or gifted. They persevere, they sweat it. The problem is that you can't draw, it's that you don't. Do it, now. Better to fail than to live with regret. Today is your day to start. Stop deciding and start doing. Be kind to you. Indulge yourself a bit. Turn down your inner critic just for a day. Forgive yourself. Take a leap into the unknown, fly. Vulnerability makes you tough. Show yourself and own it, wounds and all. Let it out and move on. It'll make you free, it'll make you resilient, it'll save others. It's the hardest, most generous act. 
Look, I'm sure there are even more ways that art can make a difference in your life, but I gotta finish this video sometime. And hey, this essay, list of suggestions, is one that I originally wrote for my thousands of subscribers. I sent out a free essay every Friday, and you can get it too. Go to dannysessays.com. Here, dannysessays.com. Sign up. Give me your email address, and I'll know where to send it. And we'll have a dialogue. If you like what I wrote, or you want to argue with me about it, you can respond to the email, and I'll read it. Thousands of people do. I spent a lot of time reading what they wrote. It's fascinating. I'd love to see what you think. So sign up. I'll see you there. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay. Anybody got any thoughts about that? All of the clips that you're going to see in this video are taken from a from my Patreon page, specifically right. on Alla Prima painting. See, if you want to get into that, see, I can't get it to stop when I want it to stop. I can't get it to start when I want it to start. I don't know. Anyway, uh, anybody got any thoughts about uh, that little dialogue? You hear anything that maybe helped or? Kind of changed your viewpoint on any anything about this thing about making art. Not new. Nothing new. No. Oh. Oh well. <laughs> okay. It's really hard to understand. They these folks need to learn how to use their equipment ah. because it's very hard to understand. But the only thing if you read what he's talking about. Before he says it, you know what he's just about what he's going to say. I feel I don't know. It's oh, okay. Not that interesting. All right. Well, yeah, I. He doesn't post all that often. Actually, you're more interesting when you talk about something than he. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I, I've I've listened to several of his uh, videos and things, and, you know. I pretty much so agree with it, you know. Um, you know, working with the group of people that I work with on a on a regular basis, you know, most of them being people who are retired. Um, a lot of what he has to say answers a lot of the questions that many of you, you know, kind of are dealing with. You know, it's like, you know, well, you know, I can't draw well, or I can't do this, or I can't, you know. And it's, it's getting you past that point where your frame of mind is not looking at the things that you can't do and just getting you doing them, <laughs> you know? It's like once, once you're in motion, you know, most of you figure it out, you know, you find a way. Um, but, you know, there's, it, it, my biggest challenge is that there's always resistance from a lot of you about, well, you know, I don't do that well. You know, I can't paint flowers or I, I have a hard time painting faces or something like that. And okay, you know, you may for the first few times, but you do it and you keep practicing it and magically you get better, right? You know, and it, it, it really all comes down to And what's really funny sometimes is you do a piece of artwork and you think it stinks. And some and three other people walk by it and think it's the best piece you've ever done. So <laughs> it's all opinionated. It's, it, and you need to believe what you got is. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and to kind of address, you know, your, your point. Um, a lot of times when you do a piece of artwork, you're so close to it and so wrapped up and involved in the process and it didn't go the way you thought it should go, right? And you you can't see the positive aspects of it or you can't see the, the things that some of these other people who are not wrapped up in it can come by and look at and, and recognize. And it, you know, that's that's like my, my story of a lot of times, you know, when I finish a piece of artwork, 
you know, and I've worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. And, you know, finally I just like, eh, you know, and I walk away and I'll put it up for a couple of weeks and, or a couple of months, sometimes a couple of years. <laughs> and then I'll be digging through a pile of, of paintings, you know, and I'll come across it and go, oh, that's really not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and you got to get that distance from it. You know, uh, just when I have done animal portraits, like there, I have to I have to think about. I see something wrong and I can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. and that's when I put it away and bring it back, and then I realize what's the matter. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's just it's the same. It's just a different process. <clears throat> it's going to be good when you get through. Yeah. Yeah, I, the main thing is, you know, don't give up, you know, don't give up on yourself and don't give up on that piece of artwork. It's, after all, you know, my favorite saying is, it's just pain. And so you can always add more pain, right? So you, you just keep working it until, you know, you get it where you want it. So, and that's not always an easy thing to do. You know, it's a struggle for anybody. And... I don't care whether you've been doing it, you know, 50 or 60 years or you've been doing it for, you know, five or six weeks. You know, it's, it's always going to be, you know, kind of a struggle. So, right? Anyhow, anybody else got anything to say before we move on? Move on. All right. So we're going to move on. All right. Uh, now, some of you using acrylics, you have asked me on several occasions, it's like, okay, so how do I blend acrylics? And my common answer to you is you work in smaller areas, right? Okay. So uh, not that you're really going to see anything particularly different, but I want you to see somebody actually working in acrylics and doing what I'm telling you to do. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, you might want to watch this. It might it might give you some insights. Yeah. Watch it. All right, and we're gonna go here. Right, Armando. These shoes have a zero drop, so this is pretty much a fake. Okay, let's skip that ad. We don't need shoes with zero drops. There's no dialogue in this, by the way. My goodness.
So did you guys see anything in there that? Uh... Well, she is from India. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is true. But not everybody has a different way of doing that. It's, it's, she put in the the eyes and the, the uh, everything first. And when I do uh, a face, if ever I do one, mm -hmm. I usually put a basic shape in the in the uh, face first, and then I put in the eyes and the nose and the mouth. It's directly opposite of the. So everybody paints a different way. Yeah, but notice too that she. She basically didn't finish anything. She put in like her strong darks, you know, right. basically drew her her features, like, you know, with the mouth and things in all fairly dark values, right? Right. Right. And and then from there, then she laid in a general tone that was transparent. Right. See, so she didn't paint over. Well, she did. She went over all of those yeah, features, but because they were dark, they still showed through yeah, the transparent yeah. color that she put down as a general base right. for skin tone. So, you know, she could have done it either way. She could have put down the general color first and then put the dark over it or vice versa. But now, the only way that wouldn't work <clears throat> is she was using opaque color, see? And so by putting that dark down first and then going over with transparent color, you know, she, she was able to keep things intact, right? And actually one of the advantages of doing that is the fact that with those darks, you know, that you're putting down, when you go over it with the transparent color, it unifies all the color because again, it shifts the temperature and things to be more in keeping with, you know, the rest of it, okay? Yeah. All right. Hmm. All right. Eloise, you okay? She's gone. I hope not. No, yeah, she's in the class, but maybe she went to do something. No, 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 she's not gone, she's there. Yeah. So, uh, she stepped out of the room. Huh? She stepped out of the room. No, she's not out of the room. She's actually at her desk, but her head is back. <laughs> Eloise? Hello? Ah, there she is. Yes, Miss Paul. Okay. You okay, Eloise? She passed out. <laughs> I'm sorry, I dozed off. <laughs> oh, okay. I was wondering, you know, I was like, I, I kind of saw your head nodding there for a while. And then you went quick. It's like, is she okay? Oh, right. It's called it. a hearing act by a magician. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. We well, were getting ready to call 911. Yeah, we were. Oh, wow. We were just checking on you. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. All right. No, I'm no, okay. No big deal. Okay. All right. Well, I, did, I didn't mean to send you into nap time with that. <laughs> <laughs> it, must, it must have been that kind of lo-fi, you know, um, what do they call it, dub beat music that started off? I guess so. <laughs> that, that kind of puts you in that kind of like really relaxed mood. <laughs> okay. All right. No worries. Thanks, Veronica. <laughs> Anyway, all right, so, uh, so let's see, how are we doing time-wise? Uh, yeah, we got about half hour. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you, let's see, what is it that I want to show you next? Uh, we got, yeah, landscape designing deep space. He's got some good stuff to talk about in there. I have several points of contention with, with that piece, you know, with that particular thing. Um, what I'm thinking, yeah, it's not bad. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do, now this is Chelsea Lang, who, uh, Leanne King mentioned as one of the people that she follows. 
Okay. And we've seen Chelsea Lang before, uh, but she's going to go through this whole a la prima, you know, this is my exact process of, you know, how I do this thing. And, uh, and she, you know, she's always good. You know, she's, you know, <coughs> good stuff to watch. Okay, so let's go to, and this should take us right up to just about 12 o'clock, a little before. Birchbury, you named the original Bram shoe to have a wider toe box. Today, I want to share with you the exact steps that I have taken to go from here to here. A couple of years. And in the process, share with you the exact step-by-step -step process I use every time I sit down to make a painting. Okay, so let's talk about the planning part of this painting. All right, so I'm gonna start the way I have all of my students start their paintings, and this is, this is what I do time and time again for myself. So I start with a Pinterest board that I've put together. I have all of my students do something very similar, and this is my Pinterest board that lets me see in one place all of my painting inspiration. Um, so you can see a lot of Carolyn Anderson at the top of this board. You can also see a lot of Kwong Ho, um, a lot of contemporary impressionistic realists, Putney painters. And you can also see a pretty cohesive range of subjects here. I can really get a very clear sense of exactly what aesthetic I'm moving toward when I look at this board. For this particular painting, what I wanted to do was I have some reference packs from Howard Lyon, um, and I'll link Howard's um, reference packs in, in the description because he is really, really, um, he just provides very excellent resources for painters. So if you need really high quality images to paint from and you don't have your own reference library already put together, or you're not at the point where you're comfortable hiring models or doing photo shoots, these are really helpful. Um, the downside, I will say, is that you don't have creative control, so you need to see from the preview of these reference packs whether this is something that you're confident that you can make work aesthetically and that it matches and complements um, the direction that you want to go in. When I saw this particular model and I downloaded this reference pack, it immediately made me think of a couple Carolyn Anderson pieces, um, particularly actually the three paintings in this corner here. I wanted to find something that I thought had this feeling um, in terms of like the kinds of colors, the posing. Um, you know, we have a couple pieces where the subject of the painting is in pigtail braids. So I can already kind of imagine what this finished painting might look like. So a lot of these are really great references, but they might just not quite be what I'm in the mood for today. This one, I can definitely kind of imagine evoking one of these two, um, just in terms of the positioning of her face. Okay, now this one definitely has that feeling. Um, there are a couple pieces on this board that have like a very strong diagonal feeling, specifically from Carolyn. And I think the colors and values I'm gonna stick with are probably going to have probably closest to the feeling of this particular piece. What I would really like to do is to go ahead and crop this. So I've already gone ahead and done this step. And here is the result taking into account um, that strong diagonal feeling that I wanted in the piece. So the overall story here is working. Um, I have these interesting diagonal lines, um, I have her looking down, I have the color I want in the piece, and there's an interesting interaction between her face and where she's looking and her hands. Um, so with that, that actually gives me a really solid idea of where to start. So as far as the actual painting, what I'm going to have up on my screen is I'm going to have this reference, and this has already been cropped to the aspect ratio of my canvas, so I know that my painting will be able to fit in here exactly as intended. Um, and I'll also keep this up on my screen because it's going to be my guide for how to do things like bring her into a higher key successfully and manage the color harmonies of dark hair versus a red garment. 
All right, so with that, let's go ahead and jump in. Now with the planning out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about the actual painting process. So before I go any further, I should go ahead and say that a big part of my painting process for this is all the work that's built up to this painting. And I really can't reiterate that piece enough. It's not like I could have been painting for only a year, done the planning steps that I just showed you, <laughs> um, known the order of like how to block in this painting and, and progress it through, and everything would have just clicked. Um, no, I have been working up to the point where I could confidently work in this way for a long time, and I'm very much still in the middle of that process. I'm really pleased with how I worked through this painting, and at the same time, I 100% know that further down the line, I'm going to look back on this and think like, wow, that was a kind of like crude mistake on this particular piece. But the steps that I used to actually progress through and get this to where you see it in this video really starts with, first of all, having a clear goal. So being able to actually put together that inspiration board that you just saw was a really big part of this. The second important thing here is that I went ahead and did exercises to help me fully understand, or at least understand as much as possible, how those paintings are made. So I did a lot of master studies of pieces like the ones you saw on that board to teach me the mark making techniques and way of developing these paintings I would need for this particular piece. Doing master studies with this particular style or technique in mind, those were really, really instructive because they not only showed me like how to put the marks down and what color paint to be mixing and how to really control my values and my color harmonies. Yes, they went ahead and, and taught me all of that, but at the same time, they also illuminated places where I had some weaknesses to work on. So things like making sure I don't paint my skin tones too saturated, making sure I don't take my darks too dark, making sure that I don't get too tight on my edges and I create hard edges where they really shouldn't exist for this kind of painting. I could then go back and do exercises designed to target those specific skills and get them to where they really needed to be. I also learned a lot from Carolyn herself to identify things that I was doing wrong in my process and especially what kind of reference I would really need to make these sorts of paintings. This was something that I could answer quite a bit by looking at her work, but in this case, you know, her work is so impressionistic, I knew that I was never going to look at a reference and just look. hundred percent see the final product there. This is true for the painters across my inspiration board that I shared with you, but it's particularly true for the inspiration for this particular piece, which happens to be one of Carolyn's. And it turned out that there was honestly nothing magical about the reference I needed beyond what I had already kind of ascertained by doing the work of looking at this inspiration board, analyzing those pieces, and then doing master studies. But just getting that confirmation really freed me up to go ahead and pursue the references that I had available to me or that I could take really easily myself. Thankfully for almost all of you, the reference you actually need is much more intuitive than the reference I would need for this particular piece um, because this style of painting is so far removed from reality that there's just, there's no way to actually get that reference. Um, but for most of you, you actually will be. You will be able to get reference that really does look like the painting you want to make. Um, so breaking down things like the lighting, the pose, the composition of the subject within the framing of the piece, those things all really make a big difference and typically they're pretty easy to suss out. So that covers all of the work that came well before I actually started planning this piece or putting brush to canvas. But now that I have jumped in, 
what I'm thinking about on this particular piece is, first of all, you know, in the blocking stage, I really wanted to make sure that I captured the important landmarks and I put them in the right place. So checking my drawing early and often was really important, but I wanted to convey an accurate drawing in a way where I wasn't getting too tight, too literal, too academic with the marks that I was putting right. down. So I tried to keep it kind of gestural, free, painterly, while still having the important marks where it counted. This has taken a lot of practice <laughs> for me. Um, it's, it's not a simple thing to get to the point where you can start working this way. But again, the good news is that for most of you, you know, a slightly more academic, straightforward block-in is absolutely going to work. And if you're actually curious what that process looks like for you, so like what references do you need to work with? Um, what would your approach to building up the painting be? I have a link in the description to book a, a strategy session call to see if we would be a fit to work together. And this is exactly the kind of thing that we would cover in that call. So if you're tempted by this, if you're enjoying this video, if you have really vibed with me and all of my content um, and know that you could learn a lot from working with me, I would love to hear from you. So definitely use that link in the description to reach out to me. Now, once I got through the block in this piece, the next thing was for me to go ahead and begin getting some color down. And this is, this is the place where I am less confident in this particular piece or at this stage in being able to paint in the way that I really want to paint. So one habit that I know that I have that I wanted to try and break through in this painting, but also one that I wanted to have realistic expectations on in this painting is the tendency or desire to want to block in all of the color right from the get-go. That's really not compatible with this style of mark making. Um, and so I'm having to hold back quite a bit. Even then, I feel that I tend to fill in um, a little bit more than I would like to in this piece. But by and large, what I'm doing in here is that I'm starting in the parts of the painting that feel important. Um, so I'm mainly focusing on her face and her hair. And I'm going ahead and working dark to light and from important landmarks to unimportant landmarks. So, you know, her hair is a really easy dark value that I want to get in early. Um, similarly, the shadows on her face would also be a very good candidate for that. And the shadows on her face are actually much more important than her hair. So the shadows on her face encompass things like her eye socket, um, the shadow under her nose, the shadow of her lips. Those things are all giving her face structure. So I wanna go ahead and prioritize getting those pieces in um, and doing them in color. And then I could just let the white of the canvas act as a placeholder for the lights. So I'm not going through any kind of haphazard or random way in building up the color in this piece. I'm actually pretty strategically trying to work from dark down to light so that the blank canvas can stand in for the lights. And I definitely wanna prioritize getting those important landmarks in first so I can tell if the likeness is holding together. Now, from here to the rest of the painting, <laughs> the, the big trap that I really have to avoid on this piece is actually just overworking it. Um, so I'm, I'm working with my glasses off. I am trying to back up from this piece as much as I can. I am stepping away from it and taking breaks pretty often so that I'm coming to it fresh. And I'm only addressing areas where visually something looks ambiguous or confusing. If something is actually holding together, my instinct is to not touch that area um, until that changes. So I'm not over describing her, her facial features. I'm not getting into like super refined blending and modeling. Um, and one other thing I, I want to point out here, this isn't so much about the rendering piece of this and, and the overworking part of the painting, um, but this is about the values. So in this piece, one thing I am doing that deviates from my reference pretty substantially is that I am intentionally 
reserving all of my darks. I'm keeping them in my pocket for when I truly need them. So you'll notice I don't go as dark as I need to in her hair or in any of her facial features. I'm seeing if the piece reads with everything just a little bit lighter, um, which is a, a sort of impressionistic approach that I'm taking for this particular painting. Now from here, this really just leaves the background. This is the only area that I haven't talked about in addition to um, her, her garment and her hands. Um, so her hands I'm going to think about very much the same as her face. Um, so I'm trying to pay attention to the important landmarks that would indicate hands and fingers without literally describing every crease um, in the hands. This is hard, hands are hard. It's still something I'm very much learning um, and, and trying to refine for myself. But this is honestly what my thought process looks like. Um, and similarly to the face, I'm trying to reserve my darks and I'm thinking in terms of a very high chroma, um, mid-tone um, yeah. color to indicate the dark areas of the hands rather than simply going dark. So for example, if you think about like the creases between um, the fingers or what's happening around the fingertips, I'm not going to anything that's like brown or super dark. Instead, I'm trying to think about going to something more like pink. And for the garments and the background, I'm actually gonna kind of combine these two um, topics into one. So for this, I am very much keeping to the value structure that I see in the reference for both of them. Um, and in the background, I'm really trying to think about bringing the kinds of colors that I'm seeing in her face into the background in various points. Um, I want there to be a color harmony here. So I don't want there to be any colors in the backgrounds that aren't kind of somewhere in her and vice versa. I don't want there to be colors on her that aren't really unified or that don't really make sense with the background, um, at least to some extent. So I'm, I'm trying to sort of work those two things into one another. And the final thing that I'm really <laughs> focusing on for this painting is that kind of going back to this idea of not over modeling something, over describing something, over working something, I am not getting super concerned with being literal about my edges. So I'm okay if, you know, some of her hair kind of like comes out into the background in places so that it sort of looks like the drawing has been distorted kind of the way you might see in like um, an old TV broadcast when you like turn the TV on or off, you kind of get this like weird zigzag thing. Um, <laughs> hopefully that, that's actually helpful. But um, basically I'm okay if there are brush marks for the shirt or the hair um, that just kind of like jump out. Did you know that toilet paper is incredibly unhygienic? <laughs> right. I'm good, Charles. Yeah, I into the background, the little bits of the background that jump in to the subject a little bit. Uh, this is sort of like an optical way of creating roundness in my edges. And once again, something really important here is to not tighten up and not get too literal and not fix things that aren't distracting. If you're curious about the specific palette I'm using for this piece, I am using my limited portrait palette. So it's not my full studio palette with all of the cadmiums on it. Um, I do have a link to that full palette in the description, but basically this is titanium white, permanent rose, transparent oxides, red and brown, yellow ochre pale, terra rosa, viridian, and ultramarine. And then for my medium, I am using olea gel, which is pretty interchangeable with um, Gamblin's solvent-free gel medium. And to bring this piece to the finish, I'm really just continuing to think about exactly what I described in this video. Once this is actually fully dry, I will go over it with Gamvar gloss. That's what you see me varnish with in the videos that have varnish components to them. Um, this one won't have that because this painting won't be dry in time for that. But I will probably wind up waiting about two weeks to varnish this. 
And to make sure it's ready for a varnish like Damvar, all I have to do is touch it with my fingertips and make sure that none of the paint is moving or transferring onto my hands. Um, that would be the stage at which an Alla Prima painting with really no impasto would be ready for something like Gamvar. Now, if I were using a different kind of varnish, I would be waiting a full year before I put varnish on this. All right, and I believe that gets us through the process of how I put this together. I hope this video has been really helpful for you today as far as showing you what you can do to reach your long-term painting goals and what that actually looks like in practice. I hope this has also been really helpful for those of you who just wanted to see a more hands-on video showing my exact process when I sit down to begin a painting and take it all the way to the finish. If this has been really helpful for you and you would like help to do the same thing for yourself, please reach out to me via the mentorship link in the description. I would love to go ahead and hear all about your painting goals and find out if it is a fit. And if it is, I'd love to help you get to this exact same place. All right, thank you all so much for watching. Until next time, happy painting. All right, so. <laughs> Any thoughts about that? Anything you see that you liked? Mm -hmm. Like... I have to go, Charles. You gotta go? Where are you gonna go? Well, I have a lunch engagement. You do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to physical therapy. Yeah. You know, uh, we can wait for the women, but they don't like to wait for us. Okay. All right. I understand, you know. All right. Um, but See you out tomorrow. Well, does anybody have anything to say about this video before we go away? I like the idea of having a master inspiration board because a lot of times I see pictures that I think are useful to me or will be useful to me. And I think the idea of grouping them all together on one uh, one uh, piece of paper or... or well, one, that, that was on Pinterest. Yeah. 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 That's a good idea. Yeah, and you can save images to Pinterest, you know, that you particularly like, uh, the style or whatever, and then you can open that up. And and she's right, you know, if you're if you're going for a particular style or look to your work, it's it's good to be able to go back and actually see, you know, some of the stuff that you really admire. Um, the other thing she mentioned was that she she took some of those Carolyn Anderson paintings. And she actually did master studies of those, trying to, you know, basically copy them and get that same look, um, you know, by, you know, just reproducing the painting. And that gave her some insights into how, how she would go about using the brush to try to get similar effects, right? And so it can be useful, you know, to do stuff like that. Um, you know, I generally don't advocate that people, you know, copy other people's paintings. But, you know, I mean, if, if there's a particular style you're going after and you want to you wanna try to duplicate that painting and see if you can get something close to that style, okay, you know, it's a step. It's a step in the learning process. So, yeah, you, you're going to do what you need to do, okay? What is... Um... Old, a type of solvent or medium or something called oleo or oleo oleo a or something like that mm -hmm. um it's it's like a it, it's kind of a it comes in a tube it's been out for a long time um probably at least 30 years um and i don't see it used that much anymore and i very seldom see it in the store so i think you're gonna have to order it online but it, it's kind of like a thick oil medium you know, um, you know, that you can squeeze out of the, the, the paint out of the tube and then work it into your paint with a, a palette knife. And it just changes the viscosity of the paint, you know, to, you know, maybe something that's a little bit stiffer, a little bit drier so that you get some of those brushy marks, you know, mm -hmm. that she was getting. Um, the thing that you asked me about, 
a couple of weeks ago that, you know, well, you know, I'm not so sure. I don't like the broken edges and stuff, but again, you know, um, you know, it's a stylistic thing. It, and it, it tells you something about whether you're working very wet or whether you're working fairly with fairly dry paint. I see. Okay. And, and that, uh, if you're working with fairly dry paint, which a lot of painters, particularly contemporary painters, tend to move toward without putting a lot of solvent in it, um, it's because they want those broken edges. See, because again, it's like when you lay that over another color, you get this optical effect of the two layers or multiple layers mixing together and creating its own optical color there. And you're not gonna get that otherwise. Okay. So that's what we call open or broken paint passages. And we've, we've okay. talked about those in the past. Okay. And they're not a bad thing. They're actually can be very useful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Mm -hmm. I think, well, we have a, Jean's already left the building. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, Okay, today is Wednesday, tomorrow is Thursday, and we are going to the upper park at the, at the dam. Uh, somebody help me out here, I'm going- Morgan right. Falls. Morgan Falls, thank you. <laughs> Gee, he's like, I, I know I have it, where is it at? Um, anyway, yeah, we're going to Morgan Falls uh, in the morning, and uh, I'm bringing some some things with me to set up a still life. And uh, even if it does pour down rain on us, which I don't think it's going to. Um, we might get some rain during some part of the day, but for the most part, I think it's supposed to be a fairly okay day. Um, yeah, well, they're saying about 40%, but it's going to hit 90 tomorrow. So, so being out of the, if there is sunshine, being out of the sun and being under that cover with the fans going uh, will be a good thing. Okay. But I, I will be out there probably around nine o'clock. You know, I do have to stop by Benson in the morning. Um, I'm unloading the kiln of a load that I put in um, at the end of the week. And we're doing, we did a test firing. So this is a high fire test. So we'll see how the pieces turn out. And, uh, Cross our fingers and hopefully everything worked out well. I can just unload the kiln and I don't have to document a lot of stuff and uh, I can get out there early, okay? But I will see you all if you make it, okay? Thank you for both for waking me up. I might still be asleep. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's not that you wanna sleep. It's just that I kind of was watching you and your head was kind of like this side to side kind of, and then all of a sudden you just went back. And oh, I, was, oh, yeah. I was really worried. I was <laughs> yeah. Thinking, Wait a minute. Is she like having like a real serious problem there? <laughs> yeah. And, and then. That was the concern. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it's all on tape, right? <laughs> it is. It's on Zoom. Um, it's all right. And, and then the thing is, it's like when you didn't respond, when I, because yeah. I, like, Eloise, hello. I was very comfortable. I'm I guess you were. Yeah. Chair. <laughs> yeah, and, and you weren't out long. I mean, you were out for, you know, maybe a minute or two. But but it was long enough that I kind of got worried. It's like, uh-oh, you know. Do I, yeah. You know, do I need to call somebody? Uh -uh. <laughs> Well, thank you for your concern and Veronica for your call. Yeah, sorry. Anyway. You're welcome. Yeah, we were, yeah, it was like, uh -uh, we got to call her. <laughs> I was so, in a deep sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the, and the sleep, you know, if you were snoring or something like that, it would have been like, oh, okay, yeah, she's just asleep. <laughs> yeah, breathing. But, <laughs> yeah, but, but we, I mean, all I could see is like, your throat and like the bottom of your jawline because your head was straight. Back. Oh, wow. And it was just like, I was like, <laughs> maybe, maybe I need to really 
kind of worry about this a little bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm, you know, but yeah, we got to look out for each other. You never know. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully if you, are you, if you make it out to Morgan Falls tomorrow, we won't put you to sleep. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's demonstration, right? That's, that's, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, how to's are always good for me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, hopefully, I'll get to see you guys tomorrow then. All right. Yeah. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.